the photos you're seeing on the uh, screen are of the families of small farmers who've taken their lives in the last decade and a half. Between 1995 and 2013, 300,000 Indian farmers have taken their lives. If we divide the 19 years of data into two halves, the first, meaning first 10 years, and, or the first nine years and the second ten years, whichever way you want to take it, the rates of suicides have been much worse in the second decade of that data. <coughs> That's 300,000 people who've uh, taken their lives. I think this is, yeah, come in, come in. And these are the typically the kind of families. This is a, what some might call tribal or indigenous people, what we call Adivasis. It's a family of people who lost their main breadwinner and in fact the head of the entire tribal clan. And why have these people taken their lives at a rate that is the Indian farmers' suicides rate are 47% higher than those of non-farmers. In my home state of Andhra Pradesh, if you're a farmer, you're three times more likely to kill yourself than any other person in the state. And if you're in the state of Chhattisgarh, then make that six times more likely. The, far, the, the suicide rate per 100,000 Indians nationally the non-farmer suicide rate is 11.1, which is considered high by global standards. For farmers, it is 16.3. So you're talking about, in fact, what we're talking about is the largest ever wave of suicides in recorded human history. <coughs> It starts, it really takes off around 97, 98 and intensifies like anything thereafter. Right now, all the states are showing, the major states are showing reduced numbers of suicides, which is a bit of a fraud, which I will get into. But all this is happening within a larger context. You know, every suicide has a multiplicity of factors behind it, not just one. But when you have 300,000 in the same occupational group, you want to start looking for the common factors between those suicides. Right. So it, every suicide has a multiplicity of factors, but all this is unfolding within a context. The context of two decades, the last two decades of neoliberalism in India and <coughs> the rise of consolidation of corporate power. October, by the way, this October, was uh, a very large month for meaningless anniversaries, commemorations, international days and international years of very meaningful events and, and uh, anniversaries. I mean, October 15th, for instance, was the International Day for Rural Women. There wasn't a single piece on it in any newspaper that I looked at, nor on television. The International Day for Rural Women was, entered, was begun in 2008 following the collapse of Wall Street. And it partly recognized the fact that the situation of rural women had worsened considerably with massive male migrations towards towns. So like typically in India, rural women who did all the dairying, all the caring, of, caring for of livestock, were now suddenly forced to take on much greater burdens in crop agriculture as well as millions of men move towards the cities in search of jobs that are not there. So there was not, by the way, there wasn't a single UK newspaper either that did anything on the International Day for Women. Guardian had an infographic not connected with this, just something about female participation in, uh, in, the, in, in farming, but there was nothing on the International Day for Rural Women. October 17, two days later, was the International Day for Eradication of Poverty and you know how well we've been doing that since 2008. So that too just went by. 
it's like the UN bureaucracy keeps putting up these days and years in, in honor of species that are in danger of extinction. And uh, life goes on at the, at the ground <coughs> with the situation of those we are commemorating steadily deteriorating. Uh, by the way, the entire year of 2014, and not, nothing much on that either in the media, the entire year of 2014 is the International Year, United Nations International Year of the Family Farm. <laughs> and which essentially is the institution under worldwide attack. And many of the suicides you're seeing amongst farmers in many countries, that farm suicides are happening around the world. They're not just in India. In India, the intensity is greater, but say in <coughs> Europe, if you took it, France has the largest number of farmer suicides. Two a day, oh, sorry, one every 48 hours, one every two days is the French farm suicides. Not terrible compared to our own figure, which is 46 a day, uh, but pretty bad given the size and strength of the French farming community. It's high for them, it's very high for them. And they're probably the biggest agrarian country, in, farming country in Western Europe. Um, so it's happening. The family, International Year of the Family Farm was declared, <coughs> was declared by the UN in New York in the United States. And nowhere is the family farm dying faster than in the United States. Between 1987 and 1992 alone, the rate of bankruptcies and winding up of family farms in the United States was 32,000 a year. It slowed down after that because the number of farms has so significantly fallen. <coughs> but you have still up to 300 bankruptcies in a week sometimes in the farm belt. The family farm is an institution under assault everywhere. And basically what you're looking at is a gigantic assault on family farms and on small medium farms, the assault of corporate agriculture. That's essentially it. It's also unfolding in a context, and I think that is the central context, of unprecedented levels of inequality, certainly in independent India. We have never seen that kind of inequality. So the family farm anniversary went unnoticed, that the year of 2014. The rural women's anniversary went unnoticed. International Day for Eradication of Poverty, not a mention. But the anniversary that was picked up by every Indian publication, or commemoration <laughs> rather, was October 20th, Forbes Asia. Forbes magazine Asia declared that every one of the 100 <laughs> richest Indians is now a dollar billionaire. Every single one of the 100 richest Indians. That is a fantastic growth rate because in March the same year, it was 56. And it went up to 100 by October 20th, which is the Forbes, date on the Forbes issue. And what's more, those 100 billionaires increased their net worth by one third in the space of eight months. And uh, understand this, India is number four in dollar billionaires in the world. Number four. The same country is 135th in the Human Development Index of the United Nations. Below every Latin American nation there is and below every nation in the Caribbean bar Haiti. Barring Haiti, they're below the others, <laughs> the Caribbeans as well. But nobody, uh, the UK doesn't come anywhere close in the number of billionaires that we have. Neither do Australia and Japan together. There are between us and the United States a few pretenders like China and Russia. The Chinese billionaires are pretty pathetic. I mean, their, their net worth is av on average about a billion apiece. Piffling. But the Russians, uh, so you, our, our net worth per capita billionaires is about three and a half billion. And as for the Russians, as I keep saying, there is our obvious moral superiority. Every five years, the Russians send all their billionaires to prison. <laughs> we send us to parliament. In the, elections, in the elections of May 2014, 
82% of our members of parliament are not millionaires, they are, in, this is in Indian rupees, the billionaires are in dollars, but in Indian rupees, 82% of members of parliament are now multi-millionaires, meaning they have a minimum value of 10 million rupees. Usually it's much more than that. Many of the second term MPs have increased their assets by between 300 and 700 percent. It's a rate of growth you will not get on any investment in any stock market in the world. Okay. Between 300 and 700. There are some who have done, you know, 2,000 percent increases in their net asset worth. So you have this fantastic concentration of wealth happening. A hundred, oh yes, our hundred dollar billionaires are worth 346 billion, which is about 10 to 12 percent of gross domestic product. In a population of 1.25 billion people, about a hundred individuals are worth about, it is pretty stunning, isn't it? Uh, we're very proud of it. I mean, you should see the amount of media coverage this got. Rural women, who the hell, you know, how do they manage? So, uh, on, you have this fantastic situation where we are ranking number four steadily. It's not just this year. We've either been four or five in the billionaires list, 135th in the Human Development Index. We are now 57th in the Global Hunger Index uh, and consistently been outperformed by Rwanda, which apparently handles its food security better than we do. It's been above us for most of those last 10 years. The Global Hunger Index is an index of the International Food Policy Research Institute, Washington, DC. And uh, yeah, so you, you, in, in terms of, uh, take, uh, if you take say health, one third of all stunted children are in India. One third of the world's stunted children are in India. Highest rate of malnourishment amongst any big nations, which is 46% amongst children below five, which rate, by the way, is almost double that of sub-Saharan Africa, which is 25%. Ethiopia's is 38%, India's is 46%, according to the National Farm Family Health Survey, round three. <clears throat> All this has been achieved in a period when we've had 9% to 7% growth. Okay? So you've had fantastic growth, 9% growth for a decade. We never, talk, we, we never tire of talking about it, and which produced absolutely nothing for well over half the population, especially the bottom half of the population. So that it's in the context of that inequality that a lot of problems begin to unfold, and farming is already, already the lowest wage sector of the economy. Being the lowest wage sector of the economy, as inequality deepens, that is the sector that takes the <coughs> worst hit. The, it, it, the 2011 census of India is stunning. It's dramatic. Never in the history of independent India has there been such a census showing us what this census does. Never, in, and the last time a census shows us anything clearly, or anything resembling the rural urban configuration in India was 1921. In 1921, the only time ever there was a net deficit in the rural population, a fall because we lost between 11 million and 16 million lives in the influenza epidemic with soldiers coming back from France having fought with mustard gas and who knows what other poisons were used. The, all over the world, you had millions of people dying from that epidemic, even very large numbers in Spain, in the United States, and UK, and elsewhere. So that was unique. We have had no influenza epidemic or any yet. In two, the 2011 census shows us that for the first time in our history as an independent nation, urban India added more to its population than rural India. And that has clearly happened because of massive, massive migrations of the rural population, very often and very largely driven by distress as agriculture tanks. Agriculture in India, at the start of the neoliberal period, accounted for 30% of GDP. That's 1991-92, it accounted for 37% of GDP. By 2001, 
that had come down to 27 percent. Oh, sorry, by 1999 that had come down to 27 <coughs> percent. It is today 14 percent of gross domestic product. <coughs> However, the number of people engaged in this sector is very large. It's very large, uh, over 50%. They're not farmers. And I think that this should be clear because some of the worst writing, some of the worst contributions that academia has made, and they have been pathetic, even worse than journalists, when it comes to the farm crisis and farm suicide. You have a couple of learned Columbia dons who have written a book in which they say, so 250,000, a quarter of a million Indian farmers have committed suicide. So what? It's very small when you consider the number of farmers there are. 53% you know, of the population of our <coughs> farmers. So 300,000, 250,000 knocking off their own lives. In fact, they end up making this mocking comment verbatim. Uh, they say, this is Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and Professor Arvind Panagriya of the Columbia University. Both dons of Columbia, both economists of India, uh, who are Indian, of, or at least of Indian origin. And say, in fact, farm suicides, if you look at it in that light, are so low that we need to drag down the rest of society's suicide levels to the level of farmers. And it's based on an understanding that 53% of Indians are farmers. By the way, uh, those who have not read me, any, any idea of how many, in, what percentage of the Indian population are really farmers? Make your wild guess. 17. 17. 17? Any other bit? 15. 15. 15. 15.15. 1.5. Much closer. Less than 8% of Indians are farmers, full-time farmers. Okay. The census of India divides people into workers, non-workers. It divides workers into full workers and main, main workers and marginal workers. A main worker is someone who has done 183 days, six months <coughs> in a given occupation. Once you work six months in that occupation, it means you are dependent on that occupation. Farmers in terms of main worker cultivator is 7.8% of the population. That's still 98 million people. But it's not 53%. Because you, and, but you can't explain that to a couple of dons who haven't a clue who a farmer is and won't recognize one if you kick them in the face. Right. Uh, they write that 53% of Indians are farmers. 53% of Indians are engaged in the agriculture sector. Everybody working in Bollywood is not an actor. Huh? <laughs> In fact, actors are the smallest section of the Bollywood workforce. They're the tiniest section of everybody in the everybody in the education sector is not a student or a teacher. There are millions of people involved in the education sector whom you don't see or think of. Right? I mean in India certainly. Everybody engaged in agriculture is not a is similarly not a farmer. The full-time farmers, and those are the ones. The, and even within that 7.8%, the police exclude a very large number of people from counting in the counting of suicides. They only count those whose name appears on the land title deed. I have been present, uh, I have visited 850 households where there have been these suicides, and that's where these photos are taken. The, uh, First thing, the policeman or the local revenue official comes and says, he doesn't give a damn about the family, it's death, it's lost. He says, show me the title deed. Whose name? Is his name on the title deed? No? Then it can't be a farmer's suicide. It'll be counted as a suicide, but it won't be counted as a farmer's suicide. So what it means is that thousands of tenant farmers who commit suicide don't get counted. Of course, the largest group of farmers who don't get counted are women because they have no property rights in land by custom not by law okay so women farmers don't get less than 12 percent of the suicides are acknowledged to be of women farmers because women don't get counted they're farmers wives they're not farmers their name is not on the title deed 
Actually, women in India do more than 65%, 67% of all work in agriculture. But they won't be counted as farmers because their name is not on the title deed. So there are huge exclusions. Women farmers, tenant farmers. After all that, we come to a figure of 300,000. <coughs> Secondly, what Don Bhagwati and Sancho Panagariya don't get or many others like them, including a ridiculous, pathetic paper in Lancet, which came and declared that, firstly, they did a million, you know, a millennium death survey, million death survey thing that Lancet did. And they admit in their paper, Lancet says, we didn't include farmers as a category. We did not raise questions about a farmer as a category. So we, what did they do? They collapsed agricultural laborers and farmers. Okay? And agricultural laborers are committing suicide in far fewer numbers than those of landed farmers. So they got their they started out on a wrong basis and they say it in their note that we counted everybody. Second, they based themselves on a 2001-2003 survey of the census of India, which means that they are using 1991 census data. Because by 2003, you don't have 2001 data. Right? They just do the complete, the sheer arrogance of their stupidity and ignorance is something hard to match. They declare, you're, firstly, the, in your survey, the farmer doesn't appear as a category. And then you make pronouncements on farm suicides by taking UN estimates of global suicides and applying it without touching the national database on suicides, which is the National Crime Records Bureau, the only agency that collects suicides. Now, who are these people, for instance? Oh, the head of this clan, it's called the, Banja, the Banjara clan, the, the Banjara tribe, or Lambaras. He was the, in, 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 that, in that tribal community, or in several tribal communities, that person who heads the clan would be known as the Bada Pitaji. Meaning, he is the, theoretically the father and has the responsibilities of the father of every girl in the tribe. Meaning he is responsible for the wedding and marriage of every girl in the tribe, not just his own daughter. As the agrarian crisis grew, and we'll come to what that crisis is, as the agrarian crisis deepened in India, the clans of the Banjaras decided to pool weddings, to have several weddings at the same time because nobody could afford an individual wedding. This is in the region of Vidarbha, which is the epicenter of the suicides. Note that the richest state in the country, Maharashtra, which is the capital city of which is Mumbai, and which, by the way, boasts the addresses of more than half those hundred billionaires. Every one of them, they have several addresses, including in Geneva, but all of them have, most of them got their passports issued from uh, Mumbai, and they have at least one home in Mumbai. Is also the same state where the highest number of farmers have committed suicide, one-fifth of the total, 60,000 plus, in the richest state in the country, where inequalities have grown fastest. So... Uh, the head of this community, Gosavi Pavar, it was his responsibility to conduct the weddings of the young women of his tribe. They came from many different states. They came traveling a thousand, two thousand kilometers. They came from Gujarat, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, Punjab, and came to <coughs> Maharashtra, Vidarbha. Now he was in a terrible state. Agriculture was tanking. The cotton economy was particularly tanking. Incidentally, the subsidies of that the US and EU gave to cotton destroyed the lives of millions of cotton farmers, particularly in West Africa, India. Uh, Chad, Benin, Burkina Faso, Mali, all these countries, cotton is their meal ticket, counting for up to 10% of the GDP of some of these countries. But the subsidies given, say, by the United States are so high that in 2006, the subsidy for the cotton was about $4.7 billion, which was almost a billion dollars higher 
than the value of the cotton they were exporting. So that tanked prices all over the world. And farmers who, had, who were very productive and producing cotton very cheap went bust and committed suicides very, in very large numbers because of the volatility and price shocks. Agricultural commodities across the world, by the way, the, those prices are controlled by half a dozen conglomerates. When 2008, the Wall, Wall, when Wall Street hit the fan in 2008, the United Nations set up a special rapporteur to look at what had happened, where the food prices were affected by speculation. They found, for instance, that 60% of the grain traded on the international uh, commodity markets was controlled by index funds, hedge funds, and other investors, not by farmers. The first Indian Nobel laureate, and first non-European, I think, Rabindranath Tagore said it 100 years ago, 101 years ago exactly. He said, food is a great source of wealth. Food production is a great source of misery. The actual producer got nothing. In India, neoliberalism's policies meant, first and foremost, a huge shift from food crop production to cash crop production. Everyone's clear on it. We use this term cash crop. I'm sure you're all clear on what cash crop means, right? Okay. We don't know how many hundreds of thousands of acres or millions of acres shifted from producing food grain to producing cash crop. So every new fad in the West, we were vanilla. Vanilla has a zero internal market in India. 67% of the world's vanilla is consumed in the vanilla nation, the United States. Okay. But thousands of farmers, particularly in the state of Kerala, in northern Kerala and Vayana, shifted to vanilla because of huge prices being offered by this handful of conglomerates. So everybody shifts to vanilla. Vanilla and you have a few millionaires overnight because vanilla at that point is selling at $100 per kilogram, not per ton, $100 a kilogram. And everybody gets into that, makes huge shifts. The costs are deadly. The input costs on cash crop can be 15 to 20 times higher than that on food crop. When you cultivated an acre of paddy in Kerala in 2003, <coughs> You spent about 8,000 rupees on that acre. You cultivated an acre of vanilla in the same Kerala in 2003, it cost you 145,000 rupees, almost 14, 15 times as much. So many of them got trapped into that. They were getting $100 a kilogram. Today, <coughs> today vanilla is selling for 68 rupees a kilogram. And they'd made their investments, made their shifts. Their debt was much higher. A central, as I said, there's a multiplicity of causes behind every suicide. But if you're looking for a broad canvas, that's indebtedness. Between 1991 and 2001, the indebtedness of the Indian farmer doubled from 26% of all households to 46.8% of all households. What happened to Gosavi Pawar? Cotton prices had tanked. He was, he was a cotton farmer with seven acres. He was seriously in debt and he had to conduct these three weddings of girls who were his responsibility, though they were not his daughters or directly his nieces, he was the head of the clan. He went to the bank asking them for first for a loan, a crop loan to look after his seven acres of cotton. He asked for 65,000 rupees. The government had declared 2006 a season of distress, which means the banks cannot force you to repay your loan that year. They have to give you a year's grace. In violation of the government's rule, the bank manager told him, Gosavi, I'll get you, I'll give you 50, 000, I'll give you 65,000 rupees if you repay the 50,000 you owe the bank. On which the government of India had actually given Gosavi an extension of one year. Gosavi had no way of repaying that 50,000 rupees and the bank manager said, don't worry, I'll help you. Sitting next to the bank manager was another gentleman who was the local money lender. The money lender gave Gosavi the 50,000 rupees to give 
to the banker. This is a nationalized bank, not a private bank. So Gosavi, three people sitting around the table. The money lender gives uh, Gosavi the uh, 50,000. He gives it to the banker. It's a matter of, it's a transaction of 10 seconds. And the interest, I don't know how you can work out the interest rate on 10 seconds, but <coughs> it costs 2,500 rupees on that loan. The banker then gave <coughs> Gosavi 12,500 rupees. I mean, so he was shattered. He had to cultivate his seven acres on the 12,500 rupees. He then went to all the cloth merchants, the other money. He was a person of some prestige and stature in, in the community. He was the head of a big, made the major tribal clan. He said, let me at least give me three saris on credit because he wanted to buy a new sari for each of the girls for their wedding. He was refused. So he went from creditor to creditor. He was turned away. He killed himself that night. I landed up at the village shortly after. Saw one of the most inspiring and one of the most tragic things. Uh, the young people who, had, who were to get married wanted to call off the weddings because their Bada Pitaji had died. Their godfather had died and they didn't want to get married on <coughs> such an occasion. The rest of the village, one of the <coughs> poorest of the villages in Vidarbha, sat around and convinced them that you have to go through the wedding. Your Bada Pitaji committed suicide because he wasn't able to get you married. The best way you're going to get honored, honor him is to get married. And if you don't, your own fathers will also be bankrupted if you go back to your respective states without the wedding. After, after they've spent so much money setting up the wedding, they'll go bankrupt. They were already, but it would get worse. So some of the poorest people you can imagine lined up and conducted that wedding with gifts of half a kilo of rice, one kilo of wheat, an old sari, some old vessels. These were the gifts. And the village conducted those weddings. In India, after the wedding, you have the wedding procession. As the wedding procession went out on the highway, it gets out onto the highway and you dance and sing your way through. It ran into the funeral procession of Gosavi coming in from the other direction. Those carrying the funeral, uh, you know, they they ran into the side, into the woods because it was so obviously a bad omen. But the first girl, the girls at the front of the procession saw that they knew that it was their uncle, their Bada Pitaji, and burst into tears. And so in the house of Gosavi Pavar, in 24 hours, there were three weddings and a funeral, and it wasn't funny. Yeah. That's one of thousands of tales of what has happened. Every single person of these, on those photographs, has a story. Has a story of indebtedness, of being pushed out. Many factors went into it. It isn't just farming and agriculture. Neoliberalism smashed every every support that the poor had. And I would say this, that if you look worldwide, I, you, know, you know, you can call it, you can speak of macroeconomics, I call it mechanomics, because it tastes the same everywhere, neoliberalism. The impact is different at different places, but eight or nine packages worldwide worked everywhere. One was withdrawal of the state from sectors that mattered to poor people. The state did not wither away in the Marxist utopia. It became more interventionist than ever before, nakedly in support of corporations and the super rich. That's the first. The second is the imposition of user costs and pricing on those who could afford it least. The third is a rapid transfer of wealth and resources from poor to rich. In India, which we achieved by a number of ways through budgetary means, through tax concessions, through the bud, through through uh, grabbing on land, acquiring the land of the poor and handing it over to corporations that threw away rates, destroying millions of livelihoods in the process. So that's the third. The fourth is what I call the privatization of just about everything, including intellect and soul. 
10, 15 years ago when I used to speak at meetings and people used to introduce me as a public intellectual, I used to wonder what that meant. Now I've figured out it means those of us who haven't been privatized. <laughs> because the rest have gone into thick tanks and you know, they, they so the, those who haven't yet either, those who either haven't sold out or haven't found the right price, uh, they're the public intellectuals. Right. So principle four is that. Principle five is the um, ending of subsidies and supports in a lot of areas where poor people were really hit, like in health. Uh, there are four or five other processes, including the rise of market fundamentalism is the dominant ideology of our times, the suborning of local governance and local governments and local democratic institutions, you know, by putting up parallel bodies which could take decisions over and above the panchayats, the gram sabhas, in all the battles that in, in industries of extraction have waged in India with ordinary people, the local panchayat, the, lo the local unit of government, the grama sabha, has almost inevitably said no. And under the constitution, if they say no, that we will not give this land, you cannot take this land, in every instance they've been overruled by higher authorities. So the suborning of local governance is a very, very important part of this process of consolidation <coughs> of economics. When I say the privatization of just about everything, let me give you one of the most ridiculous examples from the city of Mumbai. Several of you might have visited Delhi or Mumbai. If you go to the railway stations, you see those little boys sitting, shoe shine boys, you know, who shine shoes and take 10 rupees from you or 15 rupees from you. The Central Railways of India privatized the shoe sign spaces. Then after there was a huge loud protest, I'm very proud to say the story was done by a journalist student of mine. Then they withdrew it. But they even <coughs> privatized that little spot where that guy sits on the floor polishing your shoes. Yeah, for 1.5 million rupees, 15 lakhs as we say. So it, it just went berserk, this whole process. Oh yes, another important part of that issue is market-based pricing, which means that corporations can indulge in price gouging without any, and that brings us to the heart of the, oh, the other thing is the entire restructuring of the process of credit and loans, which is what destroyed Gosadi Pawar. Let me give you an example from each of these. Take health, for instance. In 2004, when at the height of the suicides, my friend, Narsima Reddy of the Telugu newspaper, Inadu, the person I consider the greatest countryside reporter in India, no exceptions. He and I visited a fellow who had tried to commit suicide, <coughs> farmer who, who had been saved by his neighbors. He had swallowed pesticide. That's the chosen weapon of the farmer because it's there. In the season, it's in your, the can is in your hand. One moment of frustration, you're gone. Uh, he had swallowed it, his friends from a very interior village put him on a cot, turned the cot upside down, tied ropes to the feet of the cot, put it over their shoulders, put him on the cot, ran four kilometers to the highway, put him in a jeep, took him to a big hospital, <coughs> saved his life. When we entered the hospital, he was abusing his friends in language that would have made a sailor on shore leave blush. So I said, I don't get it. Um, these guys saved your life, your family owes them everything. Why are you abusing them? He said, he, he said with utter contempt, you really don't get it. He said, I tried killing myself because four years of failure in agriculture, I ran up a debt of 100,000 rupees, four years, for a tiny marginal farm that was impossible to repay at the rates of interest that the money lenders were charging him. He said, I tried to kill myself because of four years I accumulated a debt of 100,000. Four days in this hospital and the bill is 49,000. Who the hell will pay? They should just have let me die. That was, his, that, was, he, that was his argument and he was firmly convinced he was right. They should just, as a result of market-based pricing and Indian health was always, health in India was always a highly privatized sector. 84% of all spending on health comes from the pockets of individual Indians. Um, but in the two decades of neoliberalism, 
the number of Indians not seeking medical attention purely for financial reasons has doubled from 153 <coughs> episodes per thousand episodes of ill health it's gone to nearly 300 this would suggest if we convert episodes into human beings it would suggest about 300 million people Indians are simply not seeking medical attention because it's too expensive purely for that reason okay we can we can check this by looking at the national sample survey data of three there are three rounds in health 1986 2000, uh, 1996 and 2006 with each survey it goes up the number of people not <coughs> seeking medical attention the same country boasts of being the fastest growing destination for medical tourism our only competitor is Thailand really Thailand and India are locked in a race for the number one slot as it is you see an average American can um, ha having to get a surgery done in the United States can do it at one-fourth of that price and fly business class to India stay in a good hotel get that operation done go back to the United States so it makes sense for I mean so we're very proud of this medical tourism stuff but 300 million people are no longer seeking attention health is another credit what has happened to rural credit what has happened to agricultural credit for the first 15 years of neoliberalism thousands of bank branches actually shut down in rural just as they did by the way in rural Australia just as they did in rural United States in the Midwest bank branches shut down because they were not interested in lending to farmers especially small farmers now if you talk to the government of India and look at the budget you will see every few years there's a tripling of the amount of what is called agricultural credit what we call agricultural credit has not <coughs> declined it's it's doubled it's trebled so then what's the big deal the question is who have you what have you how have you redefined the word agricultural credit and who is the money going to there's a very simple way of finding out where the money is going the Reserve Bank of India's data shows us that loans below 50,000 rupees have collapsed. Those are the loans that small marginal farmers take. Loans below 200,000 rupees have collapsed. Those are the loans small and medium farmers take. How much is that in pounds? Uh, it's about, uh, it's actually a, a pound is about uh, 100 rupees, no? Almost 100 rupees now. So say 200,000 rupees by 100, uh, 2,000 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not 20,000, huh? it's 100 rupees, so 2,000 and 100 is 200,000, it's 2,000 pounds. So loans below 2,000 pounds have collapsed, but loans above 200 and 250 million rupees have doubled. Now, when did you last meet a peasant on his way to the bank saying, hey, I'm just about to pick up 250 million and come home? <coughs> I know a couple of such peasants. Their names are Mukesh and Anil. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So, we have a way of figuring out by looking at which branches of which banks disburse these amounts. Now, agricultural credit, you would imagine, would be disbursed by agricultural banks and rural banks. In the richest state in the country, 53% of all agricultural credit was disbursed in urban metro branches. The top rung of, you know, where to hold an account, you must have a minimum balance of so <coughs> whatever. Hmm? So the richest bank branches, it's like, uh, you know, all those struggling poor homesteads in Beverly Hills. That's where the money was dispersed. 38% of the total credit was disbursed. 38% of the total credit was disbursed in rural branches. 62% had nothing to do with rural India. By the way, those of you who know Delhi and Chandigarh, agricultural credit worth 32,000 crores was dis was appropriated in the capital city of Delhi and in the completely urban city of Chandigarh. We are talking about billions of rupees. 
We are talking about billions of dollars for God's sake. Hmm? Distributed in urban centers like Delhi and Delhi and agriculture. Okay. There is a farming but you know, there it's not contract farming, it's farming off contracts. That's the cultivation that takes place in Delhi. But you have, this is what happened to agriculture and credit. So a Gosavi can't get loans. In theory, he has a very low interest loan. If he were alive today, he'd be delighted to know that he shouldn't be charged more than 4%. Then they redefined what agricultural credit means so that they could give it all down the chain so input dealers can get agricultural credit. Guys who are the commission agents for Monsanto, Cargill, who are selling in, they get agricultural credit. Now, if a, if a, if a multi-millionaire in India opens a cold storage plant in Connaught Place in Delhi, he'll get agricultural credit. Why? Because I, cold storage preserves vegetables, that's farming, that's agriculture. The guys growing the vegetables kill, are killing themselves because they don't get credit. Okay? But that Indian billionaire will get the credit for it. He'll get the rural credit. So by come, this is what I said, a huge shift of resources from poor to rich. So agricultural credit for the small and marginal farmers has collapsed. It's going to corporations. Uh, also, if you look at it, in the budget we have a, an annexure. Every year the Indian budget has an annexure. It's called, the, the name of that annexure is self-explanatory. It says, statement of revenue foregone. Meaning the revenue the state has voluntarily foregone. <coughs> In the last budget, that was $110 billion. And it was primarily under three heads. Direct corporate income tax, excise duties and customs duties. And which was one of the biggest items in customs exemption was gold, diamonds and jewelry. Hmm? Exactly what could benefit the poor, starving farmer or agricultural laborer. By the way, as these farmers have gone, sorry? Can you say something about the the, the setting of prices, particularly yeah. because yeah. in Punjab, this is, this is one of the biggest factors yeah. for the suicide of Punjabi farmers. Yeah. Though, by the way, Punjab is not in the top list because you guys undercount the suicides in a variety of ways. It's the state where the largest number of women farmers' suicides are not counted. Do you know, actually, if you look at the data, the best place to be a woman farmer in India is Haryana and Punjab. There are zero women farmers suicides because you don't accept women as farmers. <laughs> so that, but if you look at the columns of women's suicides in those states, they're huge. They're all farm girls. Now the next part of it was price and food grade. As we shifted, classic World Bank philosophy, poor nations shouldn't grow food. We'll provide food. We'll sell you food cheap. They should produce Stuff that earns them hard currency, right? And then they're out of poverty. So we shifted, God knows how many tens of hundreds of thousands of acres from food crop to cash crop. And when you did that, also, uh, the movement away towards cash crop meant that the acreage under food crop fell severely. As a matter of fact, India's food security situation is extremely fragile. From 1992, when, the ne when neoliberalism takes hold of Indian agriculture, because the agricultural year begins in June, July, not in January or March, which means that reforms come to India, Indian agriculture only in 92. From that period, every five-year average shows us a decline in the per capita availability of food grain. Every five-year average. If you take the 20 years prior to neoliberalism, every five-year average shows us an increase in the per capita availability of food grain. In 2006 to 10, the five-year period 2006 to 10, the per capita availability of in food grain in India, that by food grain we mean rice, wheat, the cereals and pulses fell to 441 grams per Indian which is lower than what it was in the five year average for 1956 to 16 before the green revolution. 
okay? Before the Green Revolution. So now every year we announce quite with, as a half truth that the production of food grain in India has increased. Of course it has. In aggregate terms, it increases every year. In per capita terms, it falls, even though population growth rates have been consistently falling in the last 20 years. <coughs> Despite that, for the first time in the 90s, <coughs> India entered a situation where population growth rate was ahead of food production. Even when we had very high population growth rates in the 50s and 60s, that was never the case. Right? And especially after the Green Revolution. So now food prices again, look at the 2008 world collapse, <coughs> Wall Street's collapse. Incidentally, I just love this thing about world having a crisis in 2008. A hundred nations, 150 nations in the world were having a crisis before 2008. It's when it hits the suits on Wall Street that we call it a global crisis. <coughs> More than 100 nations were in severe crisis long before Wall Street hit the fan. But when it affects them, we say that it's a crisis. It's a big, huge global crisis. Do you know, one of, do you know if you look at two of my favorite websites, one is Forbes. I always watch the billionaires. And the other is, other is Fortune 500. Fortune 500 also has a list of the 100 fastest growing companies in the world every year. When the rest of the world is in shambles, who are the fastest growing companies? First in terms of rate of profit, fourth in terms of revenue, food companies. And lo, the name of Archer Daniels Midland led all the rest. Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, these guys. And please remember that 2008, for which they were reporting those profits in 2009, was the year of food riots in all those countries which later saw the Arab Spring. Hmm? Tagore said it. Food, pro food is a source of great wealth. Food production is a source of misery. All those countries in which you saw the Arab Spring had a serious, serious food crisis. Egypt, bread prices rose by over 80% in 2-3 years. Okay. Now, Look at it that the rest of the world is in utter misery. The food and agribusiness companies were at the top of the fastest growing companies of them. Five companies, Bungay, Archer Daniels, Midland, Cargill, a couple of other companies, they, they dominate the food grade trade. 60% of it, of the wheat traded on international commodity markets is controlled by index funds and rich investors, not by farmers. So food is a major crisis because the acreage has been reduced, right? And there are no remunerative prices for that farmer. It's the one industry where the producer does not get to set the price in any, in any meaningful sense, participates in that. So food, yes, that's another, that's another huge crisis. Um, and indeed, the agriculture minister challenged on this in parliament said, what hunger, Mr. Sharad Pavar? from the same state as I am, I'm his favorite journalist. Um, he said, what hunger? In my constituency, there is no hunger. It actually raises very interesting questions of what is hunger. Yeah? Is it a number put out by the Planning Commission? For me, hunger is a 74-year-old laborer who goes to work on the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme 10 years after he has retired from physical labor, goes back there and when I ask him, Ramulu, why have you done this? You're in no shape to be here working in 47 degrees heat. He tells me, my monthly pension is 200 rupees. That's two pounds. One kilogram of lentils costs 90 rupees. What the hell do you want me to do? That's what he said. Hmm? One kilogram of lentils reach, but in, in the years of neoliberalism, we have seen the highest ever, the worst ever sustained price rise in food. There was a two year period that was worse and those, by the way, those two years led to the political emergency in 75. 73, 74 were the worst years for a two year period. Seven year period, eight year period of price rises, this is the very worst. So you have food. Oh, 
75% of Indian farmers are net purchasers of food grain on the market. So high prices don't necessarily benefit small farmers. They don't produce enough on their little holdings to be able to survive off that food grain. Because I, I mentioned this because the government says higher prices are good for the farmers. Actually, those farmers are not benefiting from the higher price. In any case, it's the middleman who pockets that difference. So you have input costs then exploding in the market-based pricing. <coughs> okay. When in, in 1991, most farmers grew their own seed. I mean, they took the seed out of the floss of the cotton and used it. In India, particularly, 65% of the weight of a bale of cotton comes from the seed. I mean, from a pound of cotton, 65% of its weight is the seed. Then comes the hybrid revolution. Earlier, when it was local seed, it cost 9 rupees a kilogram. You can't count, you can't count that even in pennies. It's less than a penny. Okay? 9 rupees a kilogram. Then the hybrid seeds came. 350, 350 rupees for 1 pound. For 1 pound of seed, 450 grams, 350 rupees. Then came BT with Monsanto. By 2004, the Indian cotton farmer was paying 1,600 to 1,800 rupees. 16 to 18 pounds sterling for one pound of cotton seed. That destroyed the economy of scale, completely devastated them. When I first went to Vidarbha, which is the worst affected area, in 2003, an acre of unirrigated cotton cost 2,500 to 4,000 rupees to cultivate. An acre of irrigated cotton cost 10,000 to 12,000 rupees to, irri to, to, irri to uh, cultivate. Now, current prices Acre of unirrigated cotton, 15 to 20,000 rupees. Acre of irrigated cotton, 45,000 rupees plus. Okay. 4,500 pounds, uh, 450 pounds per acre. So that cost, now the cost of production has gone, the input costs have gone up fivefold, but the income of the farmer has fallen. And that's in five words, your agrarian crisis in five words and your agrarian distress in five words is number one, in five words, the onslaught of corporate agriculture. The process of that in five words, predatory commercialization of the countryside. Thousands of exchanges that took place between farmers and laborers and others which were non-commercial in nature, are now commercial. Everything has a monetary value. So the crisis is, agrarian crisis is the onslaught of corporate agriculture. The process by which that onslaught is delivered is predatory commercialization of the countryside. And the consequence of it, in five words, largest displacement in our history, achieved without tanks, guns, by making your life so unviable that you see then the largest migrations in our history. For the first time, urban India added 91 million people and rural India added 90 million people in the 2011 census. In the preceding census, urban India added 68 million people, rural India added 113 million people. That is 45 million people more than urban India did. In 10 years, we turned it around. Another thing, where are all those? Do, do you know the fall in the farm population is so serious in, in terms of full status farmers? Between 1991 census and 2011 census, the number of full-time farmers has declined by 15 million. 7.2 million, 91 to 2001. 7.7 .7 million, 2001 to 2011. Fifth, you know what that means? It means we're losing 2,000 farmers a day. Where are they going? One is migrations, but there's another way of looking at where they're going. In the same census, next to, next to the farmer's main cultivator, two columns away, there is a, cultivate, there is a column on agricultural laborers. 
as the number of farmers is declining, the number of agricultural laborers is shooting up, which means that millions of farmers are falling into the ranks of the agrarian underclass. My home state of Andhra Pradesh. Decline of 1.3 million farmers, increase of 3.4 million agricultural laborers. So something dramatic is happening and traumatic is happening in the countryside. This is the agrarian crisis. It's driven by inequality. The largest factors behind these suicides are, in fact, indebtedness. But indebtedness pushed by a raft of policies which make up the bedrock of neoliberalism. Thank you.